We're going to start. We are going to commence in about a minute or two. Just would like to give people a couple of more minutes to join us. Um, and if you could just please uh, make sure that your name that's on display is uh, the name that you registered with uh, for the webinar, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for joining the Ontario Black History Society for our second event of our 2022 uh, speaker series for Black History Month. Um, I would like to begin by welcoming you and extending greetings on behalf of the Ontario Black History Society's board and staff. Um, thanks to those who have participated in the kickoff event that took place on January 31st, as well as our first speaker series event that took place last week. And today, um, Lawrence Hill and I will be in what I think will be another engaging conversation. And this evening, we will be talking about his new book. Um, I'm so very excited for that. Uh, and so I want to begin. Um, and first, I'll start off by introducing Lawrence Hill. Lawrence Hill is an award-winning and internationally best-selling author of 10 books of fiction and nonfiction, including The Book of Negroes, which was made into a six-part um, TV miniseries, and The Illegal, both of which won CBC Canada Reads. His previous novels, Some Great Thing and Any Known Blood, became national bestsellers. Hill's nonfiction works include Blood, the Stuff of Life, the subject of his 2013 Massey Lectures, and the memoir, Blackberry Sweet Juice on Being Black and White in Canada. In January 2022, HarperCollins Canada published his 11th book, the novel Beatrice and Croc Henry, which we are talking about today. Hill's volunteer work in, has included uh, Crossroads International, the Black Loyalist Heritage Society, Book Clubs for Inmates, and the Ontario Black History Society, and Walls to Bridges, a nonprofit group offering university courses to incarcerated Canadians. He is a professor of creative writing at the University of Guelph, who has spent more than a decade volunteering in book clubs in fed, uh, federal penitentiaries. In 2019, through Walls to Bridges, he taught a third year undergraduate memoir writing course to women incarcerated in the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Kitchener, Ontario. Hill is currently writing screenplays for a TV miniseries that's in development, as well as a new novel about the thousands of African American soldiers who traveled from military bases in the Deep South to help build the Alaska Highway in northern British Columbia and Yukon during World War II. He is a member of the Order of Canada and lives in Hamilton, Ontario. Please join me in welcoming Lawrence Hill. 
Thank you so much, Natasha. I appreciate the welcome. I appreciate the invitation back into the family that is the OBHS. Mm -hmm. And it's really lovely to chat with you again. It seems yes. to be a, an annual habit of ours. Yes, so it's, a, it ha it's a, an annual event that I look forward to. So I'm so glad that we were able to do this again this year. And um, just looking forward to our conversation and interacting with those who are taking the time to join us this evening. Um, and so uh, let us begin because there are so many things that I want to cover this evening, and I know we are already, you know, look, you know, pressed for time and um, want to have time for a Q and A as well. Um, and so just a, a word for um, participants that you can think about your questions, um, and then when prompted, when we're just about to begin the Q and A, you can use the Q and A feature and type in your questions there and we'll get some assistance in, um, in making sure that we go through as many of your questions as we can. Okay, so I, I started off by welcoming everyone and talking about our Black History Month um, kickoff or annual event. And this year, our theme for 2022 is home. How do you relate Black history to the notion of home and how does your book, touch, the new book, touch on the idea of home? Thank you, Natasha. Well, I mean, I think most human beings love the idea of having a home, a home if we're healthy, if we've been raised, you know, without being in a horrible situation or in a war zone or something, home represents safety. It, it represents, at least ideally, it represents, belonging, it represents your roots and possibly your family or the ones who, who raised you and love you. And of course, home is also something from which many of us over time have been ripped, you know, have been torn and, and yanked and hauled violently, sometimes in chains and sometimes across the ocean. And sometimes we spend our lives trying to get back home. And of course, even if you do manage to get back home after everything you've been through, home will never seem the same, so you're changed. Mm -hmm. and, and I seem to keep coming back to this business of home in my books. Um, and sure enough, Beatrice and Croc Carey is about a girl who's longing to go home. She's been ripped from her home for reasons that seem violent, but she's not sure why. She's been excommunicated from the human race. She's alone in a forest with no other human beings. She wakes up and she wants to go home, even though she doesn't know who she is or where home is. She has a complete erasure of memory. And so she's got to kind of reconstitute herself, her identity, her blackness, and, and see if she can figure out where her home is and if she can possibly make her way back there. Because right now she's lost in a massive forest with only a, a massive crocodile for a friend. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for that. And so you kind of give a little bit about um, the book, um, generally, uh, you know, what it's about in this connection to home. Um, why did you decide to write a, a book for young adults? Well, partly, Natasha, it's a book that was ready to come out. <laughs> and you sort of, you know, you go to the place that you feel primed and ready to produce it. And I was beating my head against the wall and not making progress on that, Af on that um, Alaska Highway novel, which I very much want to finish, but I wasn't making progress for a while, a couple of years ago. And I think the reason was that I was grieving. I was grieving the death of my mother and also the premature accidental death of my sister, Karen. And, um, and I think I was just too stuck in grief to connect with my own creativity. And, you know, after 30 years of writing, it was the first time I couldn't kind of find my way into a book. And so I stopped sort of the futile effort of working on something that just wasn't ready to come yet. And I said, well, what can I write? What do I have? What's sort of ready to leap out of my heart and onto the page? And sure enough, it was this children's novel about a girl and a crocodile, a kind of a fable, an allegory. Uh, and um, I did tell my own daughter, Beatrice, when she was quite young, stories about a girl always fending off a hungry crocodile. And she loved those stories and made me promise that one day I'd write a book for her, you know, named after her about a girl and a crocodile. And I finally have done that. So I guess I wrote it 
because I was ready to, but more to the point of home and children. Um, I'm sure this must be similar for you, Natasha, but when I was growing up um, in the schools and libraries that I went to, there were no children's books, novels I'm talking about now, featuring as main characters, black girls and black boys, black people. They were, they were sometimes there as window dressing, you know, for other characters, but I wanted to, you know, write a novel about a buoyant, effervescent, confident, you know, world beating uh, little girl who wakes up alone in this forest who's black, but doesn't even know she's black yet because she's got amnesia and she's alone. So her, her identity doesn't really kick into, into place in the play yet. And uh, so I wanted to write a story for children and I wanted to be entertaining. And maybe I want to soothe myself and yank myself out of grief by writing a lively, energetic story. And, and being that kind of bedtime storytelling dad sort of person. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about, you know, books when we were growing up, um, for me, there were very, there were very few books. Um, and now when I think about the role as a parent and the work that we have done and some parents continue to do in terms of locating texts that their children can see themselves in as multi-dimensional, complicated um, young Black people. Um, the, 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 the field of young adult texts has improved, still a lot of ways to go. Um, but I think as well, you know, what I haven't written a YA text, but I think what, what leads us to the, the reading and the writing is our experiences as young people, but then also what our children have experienced and how we want them hopefully to be um, more grounded, more self-assured, more connected to their history, their heritage, their roots, um, making sense of their identities. And as you know, they're making their sense, making a sense of, of the world. Um, and so I think when I hear you talk about, you know, the influence that your daughter had and you also deciding to write this book now, um, that's something that I'm hearing in terms of, you know, being a parent and, and creating stories, engaging stories um, that, and now that presenting many kinds of uh, issues or topics, if you will, themes in the book as well. Yes, well, and I mentioned that I didn't see much in the way of, you know, Black characters in fiction when I was growing up, but even my five children, the youngest of whom is now 22 and just finished university, um, they didn't get exposed to Black literature in schools either. And, uh, and, and, and they're obviously a generation, of, you know, younger than I am. Um, the only book they were given, it was supposedly exploring issues of, of racism in, in, in Black people was, of course, you can well imagine what happened in a French sentence to kill a mockingbird, which doesn't have any fully dimensional Black characters. It's really a book about white people who are who are experiencing and learning about racism. It's not really a book about uh, with dimensional Black characters. And oh, so, oh and that was the only book they were given. All five of my children, that's the only one. So there is a real dearth of literature that at least is made available in schools and, and libraries and that kids have ready access to uh, featuring black characters. And, and uh, of course, you know, I would hope the character is universal. And when we read Alice Munro, Nobel prize winning, wonderful short story writer, we don't think, well, there are white characters are just for white people. No, you think, well, mm -hmm. Alice Munro is a great writer. She won the Nobel prize. Her characters are, are of universal appeal. Well, they are. But I also hope that you know a well-rendered black character in a story featuring you know uh, blackness and black identity can also have universal appeal and, and speak to and attract and entrance all readers of all ages and backgrounds. Yes, and I want to come back to this a, a little later, um, just in terms of text choice um, and availability for young readers in the classroom. Um, so we talked about in your description about what the book is about and why you've written the book. Um, you did touch on some of the 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 themes that your the book talks about. It touches on it explores uh, dislocation, displacement, race, and black hair politics. Um, 
we see that, you know, through the book, there's also a critique of imperialism and colonization uh, and the impact that that's had on African peoples, their cultural identity, their languages, names and standards of beauty. Um, and so even though it is, it takes, you know, the fable form, you do cover quite a bit of, you know, of, of heavy topics with young readers. Why was this something that you felt that you wanted to tackle um, through this main character? Um, well, mm -hmm. well, I think we have a tendency to underestimate the knowledge and especially the intelligence of children. They are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. They're ready to absorb a lot more than we think they are. And they often know a lot more than we think they know. And, um, and I'm not going to condescend to a child. And I'd rather challenge a child and let them step up a level than condescend and talk down to them and, and be interesting and be engaging. And I mean, children live heavy, big, difficult issues. They live in some parts of the world with bombs dropping on their head or with racial injustice in this country or others. They live with uh, various forms of oppression and war. Some parents, some children see their own parents killed in, in war and other forms of violence, have to move around the world to relocate or are just mistreated in Canada. So children live mm -hmm. big issues. So if they live them, they can read about them. And, uh, and each child will you know, find their own speed and step into literature, certain types of literature when they're ready and if they're ready. But I wanted to write about serious issues, you know, of, of identity and the loss thereof and of regaining it and of the courage to confront injustice. But I also wanted to lift up that child reader and excite them and entertain them and throw some shafts of light and laughter, you know, down into the well of reading and make a child kind of help a child luxuriate in the play of language, which was such a rich element of, of my own family household around the kitchen table. And I wanted to sort of capture the vibrance, the energy, the love of language that my parents had and inculcated in us growing up in Don Mills in the 60s. And I want to land that energy, and that love of language on the page. So the children could not just find a story that challenged them, but also be encouraged to, to love the play of language. Because, you know, you can't be a writer unless you, unless you like to play with words. But even if you don't wanna become a writer, play, play with language is one of the most fun things in the world and I'd wish it upon all children. Yes, absolutely. Um, so in, in, in regards to some of the, the themes that, um, that you explore, um, I guess one of the things that for me that I, I wanted to ask you was about this exploration of um, the cultural identity of Beatrice. Um, and uh, I will also, you know, looking at some of the, the conflicts that she, right, that she has to overcome in, in her journey in pursuing her, you know, who she is. Um, what is it that you hope, um, anyone who reads the text, young people or adults, uh, what do you hope that they come away with in regards to this, her journey of seeking herself? Well, I was curious if I'll answer that, but I'm, I'm gonna begin the answer with a question. Uh, and that is, you, you will have noticed, of course, Natasha, that when Beatrice first awakens in this treehouse in the forest all alone, the last thing on her mind is her blackness. She doesn't really think about blackness at all. She's not even aware of her own blackness. And I'm wondering like how that struck you when you came upon that, you know, it's pretty early in the book that Beatrice is kind of bum fuzzled, discombobulated. She doesn't know what's going on and nor does she even recognize that she's black initially. And how did that sit with you when you sort of find this girl in the forest without first recognizing that about herself. Mm -hmm. Well, what he, what it made me think of was um, the imposition, if you will, of blackness on, on right, on, on African people and how, you know, when you, you're in trouble or you, you need help, you're not thinking, oh my goodness, I'm black, right? You're just, I'm Natasha, I'm stuck, I have a flat tire or, you know, so that's not what the first thing is that you go to. Um, and so there is that, that imposition of what blackness 
is and is defined as, and we can understand that in many ways, you know, there's a lot of negative deficit views of that, but then there's also how we come to understand how we're socialized into um, a positive sense of our identity, a positive sense of our blackness. And so through walking in those steps in the journey, you come to and those interactions, you come to understand who you are and define yourself as a black person. And there's no one definition for that. Everyone's journey in life in terms of how they define themselves as, as black is so is so vast. And so that is one one of the things that um, that struck me about that at the beginning. Well, thank you. And I, I mean, I find that journey, that journey into awareness, so fascinating, so rich. And so because of that movement into awareness, for me, is such a special moment in the human psyche. I wanted to be able to really go there. And the best way to go there is to have my character awaken with amnesia and then allow her to discover from scratch, from zero, allow her to grow into a sense of racial pride, self-affirmation, feeling good about her, her skin and her hair and everything else and allow the reader to journey with her as she moves into a positive sense of self. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's one kick-ass little girl. Like, she feels good about herself. She makes a few stumbles here and there. Like, at first she tries to deal with her hair. Obviously, she has no hair product. She's alone in the forest. But she first tries to split a coconut and use a coconut water. That's not going to work whatsoever. And, you know, she doesn't have coconut oil or any hair products, so she kind of plays around until she finds her way with her hair. But her hair and working with it is a symbol. It's a, it's a, it's a symbol of her movement, you know, into, into identity. And she does love her hair. And she, I, I like the idea that although she has no memory, somewhere in her fingertips, even if it's not really actively in, their, in her brain, in her fingertips is some sense of memory. And she knows how to kind of twist her hair and to do, turn her hair into twist, which is her first way of trying to work with her hair before she graduates to more complex things like cornrows. And, um, and I, I love that idea that somewhere embedded in her very body is a little bit of memory, you know, that, that will come to her brain later. So I guess because the acquisition of identity is so interesting to me, and really, because I had to work so hard to clarify it and to affirm it and to claim it and to move into it myself as a young person. I thought I'd allow the reader to really watch it up close by having Beatrice start with no memory mm -hmm. and having a move into, into her own identity as, as, a, very, as a young girl. Mm -hmm. And so it was exciting for me dramatically. And also a real challenge because I was, I really wanted to write with humor and effervescence and and sometimes a little bit of slapstick and uh, over the top episodes, you know, with Beatrice kind of dueling with this crocodile, this 700 pound, six and nine tooth, ever hungry crocodile who'd like to have her for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it's a challenge to kind of walk that line and be entertaining and funny and playful and kind of deft on the page while really presenting dead serious issues and really not flinching from the deeper personal issues of, of race and racism and racial identity and the acquisition thereof. And I wanted to do both, to, to really have a, a heavy hitting story and to be entertaining and playful. And that's tricky as a writer, you can really screw up quite easily. And so I found it quite hard to walk that fine line and to, and to be funny you know, about, about painful things. Mm -hmm. you, and why yeah. not? We all yes. need a good laugh. <laughs> yeah, and you did a great job, you know, um, blending that, that those approaches in. Um, so yeah, again, kudos to you for that. Um, how are the, the conflicts that um, emblematic of Beatrice's pursuit of knowing herself? And what's one of the conflicts in the book that um, I guess, you know, really stood out for you? Well, there are a few conflicts. Um, one of them is that on the heavier side of things, I mean, I could, I could, I could step into her, her tempestuous relationship with the crocodile, and I'm happy to, but, but to go to something a bit more serious for a minute, because um, you sort of know she's not going to get eaten by the crocodile because the story would end there. So you know that she's going to survive and somehow manage to tame this crocodile and turn that predator into an ally. 
which he has to do. So that's an interesting conflict, the conversion of predator into ally, which of course so many black people have to do in their lives, you know, just to survive. But there's trouble in the world. In the world that Beatrice wakes up in, there's clearly trouble. She doesn't quite know what it is, but there's trouble and there's violence in the world. In some ogre like giant figure, that she doesn't quite understand is trying to break into her brain during her nightmares and trying to sort of use a trap door to get into her brain during her nightmares and then control her thoughts. And this giant like figure who's trying to pry into her brain and take over her thoughts and pollute her thoughts with hatred, toxic hatred, uh, she has to confront this, this menacing figure, this menacing human like figure who, who's only so far showing up in her dreams so far. And, um, and Beatrice is, is pretty early in the novel required to try to understand what would motivate a person to be hateful. Why is a person coming at her with hatred in, within the intention of hate? Why, what did she do to him? Why is this person, well, she did nothing clearly to him. So why is he full of, so full of hatred? Mm -hmm. And she's trying to make sense of hatred. And so she has to almost, allow this person to acquire some dimensions in her brain, in her mind, in order to try to understand where his hatred is coming from. And that's a big number to place on a child's shoulders. But so that would be one of the bigger issues. Beatrice is trying to cope with and oppose and stand up against the idea of, of racial hatred. And, um, and so that's one of the big challenges that she is going to face is sort of warding off this hateful intrusion or this would-be intrusion into her brain and understanding the roots of this person's hatred. Where is it coming from? Why do people hate? Why does this person hate so much? And, and it's hard for her to get her head around that, but she's trying, she's really trying valiantly to make sense of human hatred. Mm -hmm. And and you you just talked about human hatred, um, but I was also earlier in your in your response, I was saying you know the the humanness or the humanity of people also comes out in the book. So we have this this thread of um, understanding humans, humanizing people who are often dehumanized and violently displaced. Uh, what's one important lesson? that Beatrice learns um, during the course of her, uh, of her journey in, in, in finding her way back home? Well, I think maybe the, one of the most important lessons is to grow into a sense of real strong self-confidence and self-love, you know, to be open to others, and to be open to trying to reconstruct fractured relationships. Something has gone terribly wrong in the world and has led her to be expelled from the human race. And she's going to have to try to repair some of that wrong. And, and to a certain degree, the novel explores the notions of reconciliation and the reconstruction of relationships be between people who have been, who've been one, oh, either been perpetrating violence you know, against others who have been on the receiving end of it. And in the novel is in the ways, in many ways, a, a meditation on, on the reconstruction of, of human relationships in the wake of violence and in the wake of horror. And, um, and so again, these sound like awfully heavy numbers and they are, and you know, I took the book really seriously, but I wanted so much to be uh, entertaining and, and funny and playful that one of the devices I used to sort of let all this float by, you know, it was seemingly effortlessly, you know, although I was working hard artistically, was to um, have a lot of raucous over the top language and to have, you know, to invest in Croc Harry kind of a PhD vocabulary. So this is the 700 pound crocodile who can talk a mile a minute and knows every big word in the dictionary. And Beatrice is often sent running to the dictionary to understand these words that the Croc Harry keeps trotting out at her. So he'll lure her with poetic language and then maybe try to snap his jaw shut and eat her for lunch. And so um, the, the play of language was you know, one of the techniques I, I used to try to you know, slip these more painful pills to the reader and to, and to allow for a, an entertaining ride. Mm -hmm. And, and in, when, in reading it, you see that you know, this, is her, this is what she's encountering, um, but that 
young people today are witnessing so much of that. Um, and I would say even, you know, are so bombarded or something, you're overcome with um, the news stories or what is happening. I, we could say locally or, you know, internationally. Uh, and so these are very real things that young people have to contend with and make sense of um, and be able to navigate in a way that where hopefully their sense of selves remain intact or that they then work through it to, to better understand who they are and what it is that they stand for and what it is that they would want to see, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's a daily thing. I mean, look at the streets of Ottawa and Windsor and uh, Coots, yeah. Alberta today, and look at the, the parading of Confederate swag, flags and swastikas and open displays of hatred. Um, um, it, you know, it, 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 it's an assault in many respects on, uh, on, on, on Canadian citizens and, um, and young people are, are facing that today and, and many other things. So although the novel has Beatrice confronting all sorts of evil forces, the fact of the matter is that we're confronted with these things in our daily lives always and we have to make sense of them and, and, and to oppose them and stand up for what we know is right. Mm -hmm. And then it's, I've it's, never lose sight of that fight for justice. Yes, and they're seeing it in real time and it is, it's, disrupting their their notions i don't want to say maybe innocence or you know notions of what canada their home is and um i think through reading something like this text helps them to see how um you know th this is a this is applicable to different times and different spaces whether it's in this you know, fictional text or in real life, that is very much something that we um, as human beings have to grapple with and contend with. Absolutely, it's applicable. And the fact that it's happening in a forest and there's a talking crocodile and a talking lemur and a talking tarantula, you know, all of whom become Beatrice's besties, that doesn't diminish from the reality of the story. These things are all applicable. And all those voices, you know, have human qualities to them. And, um, and these are all things that we, you know, that we might experience in, in real form in, in other ways. And, and sometimes stepping into a fantasy allows a child to engage more deeply with really hard hitting issues. Uh, and uh, it frees them up to really think about them and see them on, uh, playing out on the page when it's told in a, in a form of fantasy like this. I mean, just think of Harry Potter. I mean, love it or hate it. I read all the Harry Potter books because my children were reading them when they were young, so I wanted to keep up. So I read all of the Harry Potter books too, just so I could keep up with them at the dinner table and engage in mm -hmm. conversations. And, and I mean, let's face it, Harry Potter is a novel about the Holocaust. It's a novel about genocide. It, this main theme of every book is whether the purveyor of evil, Lord Voldemort, will succeed in killing mixed race wizards. Mm -hmm. The entire novel is predicated on the desire to on, on the evil person's desire to exterminate people because of their wizards, because of their racial background. So it really it's a meditation on, on genocide that children have read and have loved and stepped into. Now they might not think when they're reading, this is a meditation on genocide, but it is. Mm -hmm. If there's a genocidal thrust in every book, and in every book, Harry Potter has to confront and ward off that genocidal thrust. And so uh, I think that uh, fiction for children and fantasy is a fantastic way to introduce children to major, challenging, difficult issues and to be entertaining at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that leads into my next question. You decided to use the fable very much in the vein of, of African fables. Um, so you talked a little bit about why you did this. Um, for me, in, in, in reading the text, um, and, and thinking about that structure, it also led me to think about how your use of the fable um, is somehow a reclamation of African identity and culture um, through the use of, you know, this 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 form of storytelling. Um, was I reading too much into it, or how? What I don't were your think. I don't think so. I mean, I was born and raised in Canada, but I've, you know, I've been working for. 40 plus years with Crossroads International, which has taken me many times to live and work 
as a volunteer in Mali and Cameroon and uh, Niger and in, in what was formerly called Swaziland, now Eswatini. Mm -hmm. And of course, telling stories, having a jelly or a griot, you know, around the fire and having people dance and telling the stories of the village and of all the people in it is one of the most venerated roles in, in traditional West African society. And, um, and it's deeply embedded in, I think, in the African psyche and in, 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 in the ways of community gathering that you propagate, you, you continue the, the human race, not just by procreating, but also by passing on stories from generation to generation to generation. And um, in my family growing up, you know, my parents who, as you know, co-founded the OBHS, uh, Daniel and Donna Hill, they, they my mother t read to us, you know, every night, um, very entertaining kind of nonsense poetry, which I love for the play of language. And my father just told us stories at bedtime and he told wild stories, sometimes about lions wrestling bears, like impossible stories that were incredibly entertaining, but they always had this deeply embedded social message. There was always some sort of injustice that was being carried out and mm -hmm. some noble lion was gonna try to fight this injustice in the forest. And so my father, also loved to tell us stories and just, he had great timing. He knew just how to withhold the detail and make that story entertaining. And we'd just be dying for the next little detail to come out of his lips. He really had us at the edge of the bed when, when he'd tell us these stories. And, and that's a tradition that I really wanted to embrace. Uh, that Again, that kind of around the fire or around the edge of the bed storytelling time when you could just be outrageous and go to great lengths to exaggerate and entertain and draw a child into a story that would have deeper messages that were sort of suddenly, you know, woven through the text. And so, um, yes, uh, I, I think that the, the, the story sits in the traditions that I grew up in that I've come to know as an adult as well, including, you know, African storytelling traditions and, and very much so, uh, um, African American and African Canadian uh, storytelling traditions as well, that which were all reflected in my own, you know, household, and also the language, like the kind of words that spilled out of my father's mouth. Some of them I've never heard anywhere else, and I still wonder where they came from. Like one of them was guzalam. You know, you'd be eating liver, which I hated, and he said, "Good for your guzalam, Larry." And I said, "Dad, come on, what's a guzalam?" And G O U Z E L U M. I've never heard another person say this word. I don't know where he got it, but maybe in the army as an African-American soldier in World War II, but a guzalam represents the organ in your body that has soul. And so if you're a good person, maybe you have a guzalam. It is located in the body just north of the hippo flump, if you know where that is. And so, um, so the guzalam is this kind of mysterious organ that makes an appearance also in Beatrice and Clark Harry. And, and I really love the fact that I was able to kind of recreate some of the playfulness and inventiveness of language of my own childhood and, and get that, that, that happy family vernacular kind of down on the page in this, in this novel for children. Mm -hmm. this, it's, it's, a, it's a great story. Um, one of the, the questions that I wanted to, one of the thoughts I wanted to come back to that we spoke about at the top of our conversation was around the use of text, the access to text um, for young people. And, you know, in reading your book, um, of course, at this time, there are ongoing increasing conversations around um, what books young people should read. Um, and so I, 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 I wanted, you know, I was thinking about, you know, do we have enough time to talk about this? But it, it really did come back again to me um, it, because again, yes, you, 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 this is a great storytelling, um, but you're also covering, uh, again, a lot of themes that some adults don't necessarily want young people to explore. Um, but on the other hand, we recognize you and I, the importance, um, the necessity even of young people being able to read all kinds of texts. Um, and so I just wanted your, your thoughts on weighing in generally on that, that conversation. Um, I, in my observation, I would say that the United States as a 
little it's, it's a bit different than Canada, but then we also recognize the borderlessness of influence, right? And so also thinking about you know, the potential of what will happen or what could happen if texts are removed from students' access. Um, and then also another thing is with the, you know, ac with accessing these, these texts, what are you, just generally, what are your thoughts in terms of young people and their choice to read as well? Well, and every family is going to have its own way. Mm -hmm. It's not for me to tell another family how to manage these things. And even if I try to, I'm not going to influence them because, and why should I? What you do in your family is, you know, what you do in your family. It's really none of my business. Uh, I mean, as a, as a parent, I never try to tell my children what they could not read. And I, I never uh, limited yeah, you know, books or, or tried to take a book out of a child's hand and tell a, book, a child they shouldn't read a book ever. Mm -hmm. And my parents never tried to do that for me either. Some families do want to protect their children from certain texts, maybe because they're afraid of the arguments that are made in those texts and they're offended by the arguments, you know, maybe because they think their children shouldn't be exposed to these painful issues yet. But, you know, um, Anne Frank died in the Holocaust, so I can't see why children can't read about Anne Frank dying in the Holocaust, and she died as yeah. a child in the Holocaust. And I guess each family and each child will determine the, the speed and the readiness you know, that they have and what they're able to read when. But let's face it, come on, let's get real here. If a child wants to read something, do you think a parent's gonna be able to stop them in the year 2022? Mm -hmm. Like maybe they won't be reading it at the kitchen table while the parents look. But you know darn well that if that child wants to read something, they're going to find it, whether the parents agree to it or not. Maybe they won't find it when they're seven years old, you know, but they'll find it when they're nine or 10 or 11 or 12, and they'll read what they darn well want to read. Mm -hmm. And so you might think that you're protecting your child by not letting them have access to certain things, but then you don't have the opportunity to, pre to prepare them for, the, for, for that material, that difficult material by having conversations. But if you have the conversations, whether it's in, in the family or in school, then you're helping to prepare children for challenging and difficult things uh, rather than just protect them by sort of isolating them from, from painful things. So each family will find its own way. But uh, I personally have never been one to try to discourage my children from reading or, or to tell them what they, they couldn't read. Um, if you want to be more specific about the things you're alluding to in, the, in your question, I can go there, but I'm not sure if you want to or not. Well, there's, so you, you touched very well on, you know, the family context. Um, but for me as an educator, I was also thinking about in terms of the, in the classroom. Um, right. And I'm sure that you will be having a lot of conversations with educators and school boards. Um, and as in, in, in the, there's been ongoing efforts here, I'll talk about in the Ontario context, to really um, diversify the kinds of texts that students are reading in English classes. But there's also um, some conversation still about what should students read in, in yes. class. And, um, well, what, and, and so I also I, I just you know, also wanted to delve into that a little bit because sure. I think that there is, um, in terms of text as it relates to Black authors as well, that there are some implications for those, those kinds of decisions um, relating to whatever reasons that may be. And so I just wanted your, you know, your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, I will. I will. Um, I mean, I go into, I, I teach at the university. I'm a professor at University of Guelph. I teach creative writing, but so I'm not a high school teacher and I do not claim to have any expertise academically about pedagogy for children. I'm a parent and I'm a writer and I go into schools maybe 25 times a year that I've read in schools to talk to kids and mostly high school or middle school. So I've been doing that for decades and I love to visit with students in school, but I'm not an expert. So I wanna say that off the top, but as a writer, as a black writer and as a parent, and as a big reader and as a Canadian citizen, um, I feel that there's a discouraging trend that really worries me these days. And many teachers are reaching out to me now and different school boards around the province and telling me, that they're no longer allowed to teach my book or books by other Black Canadian writers because those books 
mine and those of others sometimes you know, contain the N-word. And because of this, uh, they're no longer allowed to read those texts. And I feel that that is a completely self-defeating attitude towards literature, which might be guided by a noble intent to protect children from pain, but which in reality strips children of the opportunity to be exposed to black writers because the N-word is part of my lived experience. You know, my, I was spat in the face and called it, you know, as a child. And I know the feeling of that and getting the fist fights because of it and all those things as a boy. And, and, um, uh, and, and as, a, as, a, as a writer, you may wish to explore those things and dramatize them and, and, and make sense of them on the page and, and offer those experiences up to your reader. And so sometimes it's necessary to go to painful language in order to dramatize things that you feel are worthy of artistic exploration. So if you ban the N-word in literature and schools, you're also banning a lot of black writers. Uh, David Cherry Andy, Essie Adujan, double Giller Prize winner, myself and many other black writers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Toni Morrison, I could go on and on. Many black writers would no longer be read by students if you're banning literature that contains the n-word. So uh, my feeling is that it's well, it's well intended because it's supposed to protect children from pain, but in effect, it's denying them access to black literature. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, how um, can teachers be equipped to teach through that? How can they, you know, do some pre-teaching before you enter a text around the N-word, the history of the N-word, the use of the N-word, um, so that you help students to work through the text. Um, yes. As you said, um, that's how I see it as, as, as important. Again, having these efforts of, of trying to bring in, for example, more Black writers into the English classroom, um, that could potentially write off many. And, and so I, I think that, uh, here in, in the Ontario context, that this is something for, you know, for educators and parents to, to think about. As you said, like, uh, we know that over the course of the past two years, conversations around, um, you know, the, the, the harm and the trauma that people have, have faced. And so I think these texts also do offer a space for people to, to understand that if, you know, if there are Black youth, that they're not alone. Um, for other students to develop empathy and understanding and so that hopefully we are educating and disrupting these practices um, as we go along. So, yes, so and, then, and yeah. if you, uh, sorry, I'll just add, if you're banning the book because it has the N-word, you're not just banning the book or the writer, you're banning the conversation. Yes. Because if there's no book, you're not gonna have a conversation about what are the issues in this book? What, why is a character being called the N-word? What kind of pain are they experiencing? What has their life been like? There's no opportunity to have in a controlled, productive, intelligent, civilized way in a safe environment, that conversation. If you can't have that in the classroom, where is child gonna have that conversation mm -hmm. in a controlled and constructive and positive and thoughtful way? And so you're not just manning the book, but you're banning discussions about black people, about black culture, uh, about uh, experiences that black people have had. So you're, you're banning a whole swath of conversation that goes beyond just the text. Yes, absolutely agree. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Lauren. Um, my last question before we get into some questions from our participants, uh, what is one impact that you hope that this book, Beatrice and Croc Harry will have? Well, I hope that it kind of, and I say this very playfully, in fact, mm -hmm. you know, a young reader with a love of language and the, and the idea that it's fun to play with language, very much so, because if a few of those readers become writers, mm -hmm. maybe, it'll, maybe it'll be partly because they love the play of language in that book and they like to play with language and make up silly words too. So that would be one thing. Also, I, I'd like to admire, I'd like a reader to admire and be kind of ennobled by, maybe empowered by Beatrice's self-confidence and her self-love. You know, she loves the way she looks. She feels good about it and she wants to embrace it. She's had some hard knocks and we will discover the hard knocks that she's experienced, you know, as we move further into the book. But by the time she enters the story, waking up, you know, 
at the tender age of 10 or 11 or something in this forest. She is a one confident little girl and I so admire her, her pluck and her self-love. And I want every child to feel that they can love themselves. They can love the way they look. They can love the way they are. They can just saunter forth in the world and feel good about themselves. And so that, that sort of self-confidence is something that I'd really like to instill in young children. And maybe they'll feel a little bit more by seeing how self-confident Beatrice is. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so powerful and also applicable to adults as well who may read the book to see that, you know, that there's no timeline so to speak, in terms of um, making sense and embracing who you are. Yes, and I'll say it finally that I think there's a bit of an arbitrary distinction between children's literature over here and adult literature over mm. there. We act as if they're like in different worlds. Yeah. Well, when I was a child, I was reading adult literature. Mm -hmm. When my children were children, they were reading adult literature. And as an adult myself, I still love to read children's literature. Yes. So it's a bit of a Venn diagram. And there are intersecting circles where children and parents and adults of all ages are reading the same books and loving them. And we tend to forget that, to think that these things are, are completely here or there. But I love the idea of children and adults reading and discussing and enjoying the same books exactly. and drawing what they can from them. And I hope that that's what that's the kind of readership that this book will engender. It's, you know, whether you're 75 or, or or, or seven, you know, I'm hoping that uh, the book can appeal to and bring together, you know, readers of different ages. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And we are so excited that we will be <laughs> able to give away a few copies of your book to um, participants who have joined us this evening. And so we will be doing a random draw for 10 copies of Beatrice and Croc Harry. Uh, and so if you can please make sure that your name that you registered with is on display, um, then that's how we will be selecting 10 lucky people to get in contact with um, for this book draw. So now I'd like to open the floor to questions um, from the audience uh, for uh, Lawrence. So we have our first question. So sorry, I, before I get to the first question, I should say, um, please use the Q&A feature. You'll see the, the icon there at the bottom right of your screen. Please type in your questions. Um, and I will get to the first question. I know it may take you some time to, to type your question, but I wanted to get to the first question that's there in the Q&A. And this comes from Dorothy Abbott, who is one of our board members. So Dorothy says that in listening to this conversation, I was intrigued to hear the discussion in reference to the Holocaust and Frank and Harry Potter. I just finished devouring two of the mouse's um, books and ordered copies for her 12 year old grandson. I feel that your new book will be an interesting read for him to help bolster his own self-confidence as a mixed race child and look forward to reading it herself. So more of an observation, but a question, but I'm sure that you could speak to that. Well, thank you, Dorothy. It's nice to see you again. It's mm -hmm. nice to hear your, your voice. I wish we were meeting in person, but it's great to see you participating. I haven't read the mouse books yet, but I'm very troubled to see how actively they've been banned you know all over the united mm -hmm. states and and many books by black writers are being banned as well because they're dealing with black themes that many people don't feel should be dealt with in schools and so there is a real rise in the banning of black literature uh it, you know throughout the americas these days and it's it's a very troubling development i'll have to read the mouse books i'm sorry i haven't read them yet but i'm troubled to see them banned and I'm not a person who believes in banning books. Uh, even a book that is hateful uh, should, should not, in my opinion, be banned. It should be, you know, there on the library shelf too. It is not for me to, to go banning or, or, you know, or burning books. Um, and maybe it should be criticized, but it shouldn't be banned. You can take up an argument against a book if a book, you know, presents vile arguments, you, sh you should take up an argument against it. A book is just a person speaking. But I don't believe in banning books, you know, or in burning them because I feel it's a way of stymieing, you know, human debate and human conversation. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that. Um, any other questions or comments? Let me just go back to 
the Q&A feature. I will just say while um, people are maybe considering they're typing their question that I recall um, reading Anne Frank's book and I actually read it a few times um, as a young person. It was such a, a powerful text for me uh, as, you know, as a young person thinking about the different kinds of experiences that young people have and have to, you know, have to deal with. Um, and how that that kind of broadened my understanding, you know, outside of my, you know, very small uh, nucleus of, of my life in my community. Uh, it, it, it's a very powerful text. It sure is. Uh, that reminds me of something I'll share with you if you're waiting for a question to come. Mm -hmm. Are you still waiting? Yes, please go ahead. I, I've spoken often in churches, but I've often spoken also in synagogues. And one time I was speaking in the synagogue in Hamilton about the Book of Negroes. And at the end of that long conversation that was quite friendly and amicable, an old woman stood up and asked me quite testily, quite angrily, Mr. Hill, and you can feel silence go you know, over the room. What do you think was worse, the Holocaust or the transatlantic slave trade? And the room just fell silent and people were just horrified by the question and dreading, of course, my answer. And I just said, I, I don't think it serves us any purpose in life to quantify and to try to compare the gravity of these experiences. All we have to do is agree that they're both monumental insults to humanity. It doesn't help us love each other and move forward to try to say that my suffering was worse than yours or yours was worse than mine. Mm -hmm. What helps us is to realize that there are both insults to our humanity and we need to fight to prevent more such insults and so uh it was the only way i could find it out of, of that very difficult question but it's what i believe so it's what i said mm -hmm. and yeah it, 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 for me you, you're spot on it's not about um an oppression olympics as people some people will say um you know they were atrocities that human beings um inflicted upon others and that you know and people face, millions of people face, and um, that we need to uh, understand them and learn about them, all of them, um, it, you know, with their distinctness, looking at their commonalities, but also with their distinctness as well for us to become better humans. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so we have a question from Ablavi, who asked, how long did it take you to write the book? How long did it take me to write Croc Harry? Beatrice, yes. Uh, Beatrice and Croc Harry. It took about six months to kick out the first draft. And I did that in uh, Newfoundland. And, 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 and then I was rewriting in Spain and in, um, in Hamilton for about a year and a half. So six months for the first draft and then a year and a half for about 10 drafts that they came after. So about two years in total. Mm -hmm. It was really joyous. It was the most fun I've had on the page in a long, long time. Um, and uh, by the way, I see that uh, Kim Bernhardt is here with us. And of course, Kim's father, Wilson, was one of the other co-founders okay. of the Ontario Black History yes. Society. So nice to see Kim there and Hi, nice to Kim. think about Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so two years to write that. Uh, explosive. It really came out volcanically. And, and it was such fun to write. I just felt connected to my soul and to my own playfulness in ways that I haven't felt you know, in other books. It felt like that playful side of me was allowed to come out and romp on the page, which maybe couldn't, I couldn't dance quite that much in writing the other books. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, thanks. Another question from Terry. Do you envision ways that um, Beatrice and Croc Harry might be used to engage university students? And if so, how might this book be a conversation starter? for university students? Well, sure. Uh, well, I teach at university. You know, I teach creative writing to undergrads at the University of Guelph. Um, and, uh, and also prison uh, prisoners take those courses too as university courses. Um, yeah, well, uh, absolutely. I'm going to give some talks next month to students at University of British Columbia about this very issue. And there are lots of ways to engage. One would be from the standpoint of craft, because many students at university want to understand children's literature. Maybe they want to write it themselves or they want to take it apart and analyze it. So whether it's from a scholarly or a creative perspective, 
there's lots of people study children's literature at university or they write it at university. And so that uh, absolutely. Uh, and of course the social issues that that I'm trying to bring, you know, into the minds of children and bring to the attention of children is another way to, you know, analyze it, you know, in a university classroom. So for sure, uh, if, if a classroom is interested in understanding uh, or writing children's literature, then then this book would hopefully be for them too. Mm -hmm. And even in um, faculty of education courses for educators uh, in terms of, as we talked about, you know, tech selection, um, approaches to, to, to bringing in um, these kinds of texts into the classroom as well in an effective way. I see that as well um, in, that, in that field. Yeah. Yeah. Go Michelle ahead, go ahead. Asked, another question. So Michelle asked, do you have any, do you have more YA books to write? And she do said, I have more YA? <laughs> yes. I think well, it's yes. so important to get kids to read, especially books like yours. Well, thank you. I do, actually. Um, I want to write a sequel to Be Interesting and Crack Carry, and I left the door wide open at the ending. I'm not going to talk about or give away <laughs> the ending to the book, but I hope you'll come to it on your own. But okay. I left the door open for a sequel, and I'd very much like to send Beatrice back into Argelia to duel once more with Crack Carry and, and Killjoy, the dentist without a degree who doubles as a hairdresser. Um, uh, I'd, I'd very much like to write a sequel to that book. But first, I have to finish that novel about the African-American soldiers who build the, uh, who helped build the Alaska Highway in World War II in Northern DC and Yukon. Mm -hmm. So that's next up for me. And then, and then after that, I'd like to write a sequel to Beatrice and Clark Carey. Wow, that's great to hear. Um, okay, so I wanted to, I don't see any more questions or comments. You did say that Kim uh, says hello to us both, which is great. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to, um, to have this conversation. Um, again, it's, it's great to have the opportunity to, to touch base with you. We're virtual, but you know, we are still connected in the conversations that we have. And, and so I wanted to thank you again for taking the time. Um, we are, again, we're great. It's, it's great that we're able to give away 10 copies of your books to um, attendees who are online today. And so we look forward to also, you know, you sharing your reaction to the book as well. And, uh, and just looking forward to, you know, this the continued conversations. Maybe next year we will have another conversation about uh, in production, post production book, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope I can get at least a draft done in the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be great. But it's wonderful to speak with you, Natasha. It always feels like I'm being brought back into the family. I mean, I remember volunteering for the OBHS when I was, oh gosh, uh, very young. Well, the OBHS was created in 1980. So uh, I was 23 at the time. and. I remember volunteering in my mid twenties in the oral history committee mm -hmm. of the of, of the society. We were out interviewing old folks in the black community then to catch their records and their memories. So mm -hmm. it was a wonderful thing to do, and and it brings back great memories to join you. So thank you for the invitation, Natasha, and, and the salutations to all. Yes, thank you so much, and everyone have a great evening. Take care. Take care. Good night, and thank you.